You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 89. Today, for a second time, I'll be talking to Esau Andrews. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com. But the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, Check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. All right, so today's guest is artist and friend Esau Andrews. And this is actually the second time that I've had Esau on, the first time having an artist back on for a second occasion. Our first conversation was episode 50, the two-year anniversary episode. And in the time since we talked last, a lot's actually happened, including the work that he's been doing for a brand new solo show, opening at ThinkSpace. We talk all about this new show, all the other things that he's been up to since we talked last, as well as some of the topics that I didn't have time to get into last time around. So stay tuned for a great conversation with Esau Andrews. Esau, welcome back, man. This, I'm so stoked that we could do this. Yeah, I, I am too. And yeah, happy Easter. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that. Like the, the last time we recorded, it was on Halloween, just out of pure uh, coincidence. And this time we're happy to be recording on Easter, again, out of pure coincidence. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I was thinking about how to approach this conversation since you are the first guest or first artist that's been on a second time andrew's been here a second time but it was more of a like recap the last year sort of a vibe you're the first artist that i've actually had on for a second time um so i was thinking it would be cool to a kind of talk about what big things have happened since our last conversation but then also um some of the topics that i'd originally planned to talk to you about that we just didn't have time for i tend to like over prepare and i'd rather have more things to talk about than not enough to talk about. So I generally am left with things that we just didn't get to or, you know, the conversation didn't kind of wind its way into that those waters. Um, so in the like spirit of things that have happened since our last chat, uh, you made your return to New York, uh, you know, moved back to the East Coast where you lived, you know, for years previously. Um, what brought you back to New York and, and why do you uh, hate L.A. so much? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. It's, uh, all right. So, yeah, during uh, COVID, things kind of shut down. Things got a lot more simple, like we were just working at home and uh, things became pretty like kind of like we were just kind of homebodies, kind of a, a L.A. became kind of a drag. It was uh, I feel, feel like a lot of places it was really hard. And uh so we had been thinking about like, so Claire, Claire's parents were getting, or they're getting older and like they live up in, uh, up by in the Hudson Valley. So we were just gonna, we were thinking about it like, oh, we should end up moving over there to be closer to her family eventually. And then a friend of mine had this farmhouse that he was renovating and he said, oh, if you're thinking about it, why don't you take this place? And then you can kind of figure out what you're going to do and just kind of like, you know, help them renovate the place a little bit. And so that's where we're at. So we just like kind of, okay, I guess it's in motion now. And several months later, we we're packing up and moving out there. And it's this farmhouse. There's like six acres. We don't have any neighbors. There's a, there's like a creek on the property. Like a, you can't like swim in it, but it's, it's pretty <laughs> shallow, but like it's, it's wide. It's, it's like a really cool or private Creek. And, uh, we're about like, uh, I think it was like 10 miles, 12 miles outside of the town of Hudson. 
and uh, it's beautiful up there. So we've been just up there. It's now two years we've been there. It's crazy how time wow. goes by. It's amazing to like, I mean, night, night and day. Um, and because you, when you were in New York, you were more in the heart of the city, you moved yeah. to LA, another really big city. Now you're kind of out in the country. Um, how is that like the contrast between those experiences been? Uh, it was pretty jarring at first. Things close really, really early. Mm. Like the sun's still like way up high and like, Everything's closing down. That was kind of strange to get used to. Uh, but I've really come to enjoy it a lot. I really like the solitude. Um, I do wish the city was a little closer. It's hard to do a day trip. It's um, it's about a, like 100 miles away. So to do a round trip, it's like it's doable, but it's like it's it's hard to do in a day. It's a, be nice to plan to stay the night. And yeah, a lot of nature walking. Lots of, um, yeah, a lot of sculpture gardens up there in like that area of New York. There's a lot of like minimal, like metal sculpture. It's like very like, uh, these expansive, like fields with just giant monument kind of sculptures. Um, so that's really refreshing too, but we are just like not doing much except working. We work at home in the house and yeah, that's like the typical day. I've definitely gotten a lot more work done on a daily basis than I was doing living nice. in the city. There's no distractions. Sure. Have you felt um, as connected to the art community without being in kind of the heart of it? No. <laughs> I feel like I'm very like okay. isolated. So I, I would be nice to have like more regular like uh, visual art friends up there. Uh, Martin Whitfuth was up there right when I moved. And he he moved away. I think he moved to Canada. And so, um, yeah, I just got to hang out with him a few times. Uh, Travis Louie's up there. He's really close to me. Yeah, he's in this town called Red Hook, which uh, we're right by. And he was saying that he actually goes into the city regularly to, like, teach, right? Yeah, yeah, he carpools. And, yeah, there's a couple of guys that go there to teach at SVA, I think. And, uh, yeah, they do the commute, I think, like, twice a week or something. Uh, do you think you'll stay? Is that like you're your home for longer than two years? I don't know. That is like a, it's a hard thing. Cause like we moved up there kind of at the wrong time to buy a house. We were kind of just up there and it's like, oh, this is uh, it's a little, it's like what everybody's talking about. It's like, oh, interest rates are high. There's kind of slim pickings. Things are really expensive. Um, so we're not in too big of a hurry. Because we didn't really know what to expect up there. We'd never lived up there. I'd never experienced a rural New York winter. And I kind of still haven't. We, we came back to LA during the, the worst of it. So <laughs> it's like, all right, this is worth it. But I'm not sure. I like it up there, but I think the winters are too long. I got soft living in LA. This has been like over 10 years of no seasons at all. I just got used to it. And... Uh, but at the same time, saying that going back up there, the seasons are so incredible. It's great, like seeing like all the, there's like all these little different chapters of like different insects and different plants are blooming at different times. Uh, the animals come out in these kind of just throughout the year, there's just like different things you're seeing. And it, it really feels like instead of this endless summer, you see these like different seasons and it, it feels like so much has like so many different lives have been lived up there in the past two years instead of this just monotonous 72 and sunny, which I'm, I'm really right. enjoying right now too. That's everything. Is, everything's good. Do you feel like that change in atmosphere um, either uh, consciously or, or unconsciously inspired you creatively in some way? Um, yeah, I do. I do think so. Uh, I feel like a lot of times, a lot of my artwork is very escapism. Like, usually, I'll if I'm in, let's say, yeah, sunny California or like in the desert, I'm painting more forests. Yeah, it's just like these different things. But like now, I'm up there in the woods and I'm like looking at all these cool things. These overgrowth and it's also really inspiring you can see the stars at night 
a lot. We, there's no any kind of outside light. It's pretty spooky. Yeah, and I feel like just a sense of being really small up there. I think that that's kind of influenced my work a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So do you think just going forward, is it going to be you splitting your time? I mean, because you mentioned like not being super stoked about the, the winters. Um, is it kind of splitting your time between multiple places or do you think you'll end up somewhere else? It's Yeah, this, this is like as hard. This, <laughs> these are really hard decisions because I don't want to feel like I'm a slave to a house, like just, you know, treading water to like uh, keep this going. Ideally, it would be nice to find a smaller place because the place we're staying in is beautiful. It's huge. Um, the way it's set up, it's, uh, I guess it's like a five bedroom or it used to be. And there used to be two families. And so it's kind of split where there's these two stairwells and like each side has its own living room. So Claire has her studio on, on one side of the house and I have mine on the other. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, it's really like we have a lot of space up there and I don't think we need that much space. So it might be nice, like maybe the idea would be, oh, find a smaller place that's rural, maybe move back here to LA. And this would be where we're staying at most of the time and then have a place to go back up there. But I don't, I don't know. Still figuring it out. Living life. Yeah. I am. I've got to make a decision really soon because this is really, it, it is hard to keep them both going. Right on. Um, so last time we talked, we chatted, you know, quite a lot about, you know, your uh, involvement and the projects that you've done for Circus Survive. Uh, but there's another set of commercial work that uh, started a few years after your first Circus Survive album that I wanted to talk with you about and we didn't end up getting into. A few years, for a few years, you did covers for Vertigo's House of Mystery, uh, the comic book. Um, and I believe you started on issue five and then there was a little bit of a gap i think glenn fabry might have done a few yes. covers and then you pretty much picked back up all the way to the end of the series in 2011 yeah. and this is like right smack dab in the middle of vertigo and its prime i mean there was um preacher and transmet uh, several years earlier and then fables came out and developed this like important uh, like universe uh that i think house of mystery kind of spawned out of yeah uh, and then of course you know your contemporaries uh james jean and joe ruaz did covers for that series uh which was amazing uh, and i think house of mystery was originally if i recall correctly was originally written the first few were written by bill willingham which is the creator of fables and then somebody else took it over um, so how did you end up getting involved in all of this with Vertigo and start making comic book covers? So, yeah, it started way back when James Jean was dropping off his portfolio when he first started the the Fables covers. He went in to D.C. Uh, he was dealing with Shelley Bond. And I tagged along and and yeah, I met her and just, uh, you know, James was doing his thing. So I was around. And then, yeah, like just kept in contact, but like seven years, I think later, I don't know if that's the exact amount of years, but it was a lot of years later where it kind of came back around. I did like a short story for one of the fables things with Tara McPherson. Yeah, there was like a kind of an, a thicker novel that was called, uh, I think, A Hundred and a Thousand and One Night. Yeah, I remember that. Nightfall. Yeah. And so, yeah, I did like a little short story in there. And yeah, I did another short story that uh, I think also had to do with fables. But so, yeah, to go to House of Mystery. So it started off with uh, the Sam Weber. He did the first four cover. I mean, brilliant covers. I mean, some of the best covers out there. So super big shoes to fill. I don't know how it all happened, but um um, yeah, they tested out a couple of other, um, cover artists after the issue four or yeah, I guess I did issue five and then, um, they did a couple other guys and then I yeah just got that gig and, uh, yeah, that was really fun. I really liked how each story was completely different. It wasn't like there was like a, a framing story going on, but there was always like a, a standalone unique story that I'd get to read and then kind of implement that in the cover design and like, uh, yeah, what a really cool gig. So had you ever like thought about 
doing comics, like getting into the comic industry, like as an art form? Had you ever considered that while you were studying illustration or or anything like that? Um, no, uh, I don't. It is such a difficult medium. You have to know how to storyboard and really draw anything in any perspective. And I, and I'm just not that strong at doing like a tank flying through the air, or, you know, exploding <laughs> with, and all these things. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like, so people that do comics are, it's like on another level, even if you're doing like really simplified comics, it's storytelling. There's so much that goes into it. I think it's uh, one of the most underappreciated yeah. forms. Yeah, I mean, the storytelling for sure. And then one thing that I had never even thought of that I forget who it was that mentioned this as something that was really challenging, but keeping the look of a character consistent throughout number of panels, yeah. like making that person look like the exact same person every time, like that that's a non-trivial thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I uh, can't do it. I don't have the chops. <laughs> So what was like the process of, you meant, You mentioned a, a little bit that you got to read the story ahead of time and kind of figure out what you wanted to do for the cover. Um, obviously, it's it's more of a collaboration in that sense uh, with, you know, other people being involved in some form of like editorial process. But what was that like? Was it um, similar to how you had like oversight in terms of the Circus Survive covers or was it like totally different vibe? Um, it was a little, it was similar. Um, well, I would do, yeah, uh, maybe six or so sketches and then we would talk about those and uh uh yeah i would get like character sheets okay these people have to look like this um or this is some of the the artwork usually the artwork wasn't completely finished but it was good enough where i was like i could tell what was going on and um yeah so yeah there was a little bit of reference um but there was a lot of i think with a lot of of vertigo there's a lot of artistic license to the covers. It's like they kind of were doing, especially at that time, just a lot of the artists were painters and not necessarily comic book people. Yeah, really cool collaboration. It was uh, one of the cool uh, illustration jobs that I had for sure. And do you like that kind of collaboration where you're like working with other people to execute an idea? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Like... Uh, I've gotten used to just being in my own world. And so to step out of that, it's fun to get, have that challenge, but sometimes it's, I'm not, I'm not that good at it. So it's, if it's falling apart, then it's, it's stressful. So I'm not like a natural, like um, I'm not doing uh, illustration all the time for other people's like intellectual property stuff. So yeah, I feel fortunate that most of the time I'm just doing my own thing. And being part of uh, that Vertigo experience, I guess I was hired because of, of the kind of things I was doing mm. at the time. Did you paint all of these uh, with traditional mediums or was it some mix of traditional and digital? Yeah, they were all oil paintings on wood, but the final piece would be the comic book cover. So I would use some Photoshop to kind of clean them up or change some things that were a little off. Okay. Was it difficult? I know that, that comic books tend to get this uh, reputation of having really hard deadlines to meet. Uh, did, did you feel that? Was it really hard to kind of keep up with the deadlines? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, uh, almost every single one, the paintings were going into the oven because they needed to dry. <laughs> like, Yeah, not too bad. Like the, the deadlines at that time were maybe a week, a week and a half. So not too bad or anything. Are there aspects of that the work that you did during that time for these covers that sort of had a lasting impact on how you you know ultimately did work in the studio? Like, were there things that you learned from that experience uh, that you applied to the other side of your career? Oh, um, yeah, I guess because painting fast and needing to paint fast, uh, I just I, I feel like I was painting thinner when I was painting those. And using like drying medium and like push me, it's like kind of rubbing the paint around instead of like having really thick um, paint. And I, that's something I still do now. And I think it comes a lot with the, the tight deadlines. 
Uh, shifting gears a bit, and, and you mentioned that you were, that's one of the things that you're in LA for now is, is working with Static Medium for the uh, you know, print release. So I want to talk to you a little bit about you know, the print side of your practice. You know, we really didn't have a chance to get into that at all, I think, last time, but uh, it's a regular part of your offerings throughout the year, and it has been, you know, for a while now. Through most of that time, you, it's been a, a really strong relationship with Static Medium, um, which seems like a really important relationship, you know, as far as, like, your career. So how did that all start? Like, how did you first get hooked up with Static Medium and start working with them? So before, I, yeah, before I started with them, I guess, well, I was doing, I had my own big printer, big Epson printer that I was doing. And then it must have been one of the ThinkSpace shows, must have done, did a print with them through that. It was probably the, maybe the the show that was called, titled Nowhere. That was what, like 2012, 2011, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's 2011. So back then, but before that, I was, I had my own like pretty large format printer, but, uh, and I like being really hands-on with everything. And then when that happened, like doing print run with, with them, I was like, oh, this makes more sense because like I had soybean and his like little dog hairs would sometimes get in the printer and it's like, ah, this is is another thing, huge thing ruined. And it just became like, um, this makes way more sense. And so yeah, so it was back then. But I guess like I started the print thing in very early 2000s. Yeah, it's become the main thing and it's crazy. And I got to like diversify. I'm seeing people's houses. Some people send me photographs and I'm like, this is really amazing. And like, I'm scared. This is a lot of prints, you know, <laughs> really cool. I don't know how normal that is. <laughs> so I know that that they um, have a pretty um, impressive like f- photographing process. I, I think it was yeah um, they do was, um, at one of the Mondo cons that David Sanacor, when he was working with them, had come out and had a booth. And uh, I think I, I bought a an Audrey Kawasaki print from that booth, if I remember correctly. But anyway, they had a, like a mock setup of this is how we do photographing and kind of just showing people how some of that process works. Um, so you know. Do you, you know, obviously they have to photograph your work for the prints that they make, but do they do more than that? Do you photograph all of your work just for archiving purposes? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just got through because I'm like up there away from everything. I just set up this thing. So I have a large scan. Well, it's like large for a tabletop scanner. It's like one of those, like, it's like 12 by 17 size thing and i like built this like cardboard table to like scan my paintings <laughs> in sections one of them is four by five feet so however many scans 20 or something and then like stitching them together in photoshop I'm like why am i doing this um so i i do because there was a deadline to like uh turn in some imagery for some um ad stuff for this coming show so i had to do that but yeah, they the way they scan them there, I it, it's perfect. And when you print stuff out at Static Medium, like you just have the original and then like the print side by side, and you just step back. It's like it's like you can't tell the difference. Yeah, I tr- always try to like use them. So I, I even ship some things there just to like get them photographed to ship back. Has that always been the case where you've you've been really uh, good about just archiving your work? Um, no. Yeah, that sucks. Like, there's a lot of paintings that I don't have really good high resolution of. A lot of drawings and stuff are just lost. I'm always, like, doodling and drawing and just kind of giving them away and, like, oops, I forgot to... Uh, So, they're out there. Was there a point where that changed, though, where you're like, okay, I'm going to get on top of this and every painting I'm going to make sure is properly archived? Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of years now that I'm I'm doing that. Um, okay. Um what goes I guess what goes into which paintings of yours you ultimately create a print for? You know, recent examples you you had a really beautiful Knox painting that you released a print for, you did Memento Mori more recently. Um what goes into that decision of which painting actually gets the treatment? Huh. Uh 
I guess like when I'm putting, I put out a couple prints throughout the year and I just kind of am thinking like, okay, what, what's the relationship between the last print that I did and this one? And I want them to kind of be a little bit different each time. Because I know that there's like different, I feel like I have different types of audiences. Some people like certain other things. So I try to, to cycle through those. But I do try to choose the prints that I feel like, oh, this will work as a print. Even though the, that Memento Mori one was really simple, I feel like, oh, well, that's, it works because it is so simple. Like it, it works as a print, I, I thought. And it has like this more mass appeal to it. People are all familiar with that kind of imagery and the name of it. And then some of the other pieces that might be a little weirder, I might just make them a smaller edition and a bigger print just for like a different um, audience set. And then sometimes it flops, but it's it's been a couple years. Yeah, it's like I'm trying to predict what the world wants. And it, <laughs> right. It's getting harder and harder because I don't know what's going on. It's an art form. I mean, it's it's hard to. I mean, it, it, there's so many different variables involved. Like you mentioned, the size. How do you determine what it, dimensions a print should be? Well, should it be smaller? Should it be bigger? What goes into that choice? Yeah, um, I don't. I don't. <laughs> like all right i think that people are gonna like this so i'll make it big yeah i feel like with the bigger ones i guess i'm like looking at it in a way like all right there's the one called community zoo well it's like a cityscape and i like ask people online like you know what's a a thing you want to see in it and then just doing that i felt like okay i'm bringing a lot of people into this painting i'll make it big so people can actually see the little things but also like, um, you know, maybe they'll, they'll get one because they're somehow a little, there's a part of them in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're invested. I mean, there's a little sense of, uh, I guess owner, not ownership, but like I'm, I help make this happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It's fun to just be like, Oh, you want to do like a, yeah, there was one that's like, somebody said like a jar of pickles. I was like, oh, I like that a lot. I like, <laughs> yeah. I went through every single one in that legend and was like, I'm going to find every single one of these. <laughs> All right. Was there one that you didn't find? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I went, I mean, it took, I had to go back to some of them because some of them were harder. Um, I, so I, like what if I spent too long on one, I was like, okay, I need to, fre- I need to come at, back at this with a fresh set of eyes. I'm going to skip this one briefly. and I'll come back to it. But I find, I think I finally found all of them. Good. So what about, uh, addition size is another thing that's like a hard another variable every time you add another variable in, it's just a harder thing to to kind of navigate but what about like timed editions versus limited editions how what factors into that decision is that a hard thing to do yeah i usually don't do timed editions Uh, i feel like there i have a print collector base that is pretty strong but i don't think there's much beyond it and so with the recent edition that I did now I mean the, uh, the vast majority bought it within the first f- few minutes and then it just trickled in so I just hadn't done one in a while and I thought that that specific print was more like the memento mori one was just like this is I could just imagine like people that aren't necessarily buying my prints would want something like that I kind of like the one with the bat with the wine bottle. There's just yeah. something kind of goofy and like that'll go in somebody's kitchen. Fine. Sure. So these are some some things that I think about. But yeah, I don't know how often I'm going to do timed editions. You know, just every once in a while. I'm, I'm about to do another one um, for uh, Sean Hosner's benefit. Right. And that will be a kind of a different image than... You know, it'll be the one, well, yeah, it'll be the one that um, I did when her original cancer benefit, it's like the portrait of Claire and her, the back of her, um, touching her, her hair. Yeah, that one's like more realistic and it's, you know, it's a different image and hopefully people like that one too. No, it's really cool that, that you're able to, to kind of help out in that effort. Um, you know, it's, it's just so sad the i mean there was susanna first and then now sean and it's really heavy you know yeah like there's just so much it's like it's like yeah you're getting older and like 
these kind of things are happening more and more and it's really in your face like it's uh yeah it's really sad and yeah it's so it's constantly putting things in perspective of like what's important and right right what's not important like things to focus on and that that print release um for the the sean forever benefit that's coming up uh before your your next show right yeah it's like the week before yeah okay Cool, cool, cool. Um, so another print um, that I, I thought was rather notable that I wanted to kind of explore a bit was the lineage screen print that you did with Serio Press. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because that was like super unique in several ways. So I guess how did that project first come about? Because I, I think you, and correct me if I'm wrong, created the image specifically for this print project, like just the unique aspect of it. So tell me about that. So I always liked, there was this, um, an etching that I have by Aaron Weisenfeld that I have hanging up in the house. And I love it. It's just a, it's a giant pencil drawing. So I guess it's like a f- photo etching. It's from his pencil drawing and it's like, it's you know pretty big. And it's like a, a girl with like a newspaper and she's kind of like walking through the rain and overalls. And I, I just love it. And I just love the scale of it. I love like the, the big paper border and it's just my favorite thing and so uh yeah this i like this idea of like an etching has always been in my mind i'm always doing colorful stuff i oh, it'd be great to just do a big drawing i don't do big drawings and so um years have gone by uh david's working at serio press there is this other artist i really like ryan travis christian and he does these uh, kind of just goofy cartoon stuff. And he had done like uh, one of these silk screens that were like multiple colored silk screens. And he does all these uh, shaded pencil drawings of like um, kind of cartoony dogs and other things that are, it's, they're, it's really good stuff. But yeah, I saw their screen print and I don't remember how many colors it was, but it was the same process, just like a bunch of transparent grays over and over again to like make it look like a, a drawing. And yeah, so between those two things, I was like, okay, this is what I, I, I like this. Like uh, I can't do an etching right now, but this looks kind of like an etching. I, I want to do a, a gray scale kind of giant pencil drawing because I haven't done one of those. And I want it to be more about the image rather than like the all the rendering that I usually do. So yeah, so that's that's how it came about and uh yeah, I'm I'm happy with it. I want to do more. I want to do an actual real etching eventually mm-hmm. too. How involved were you in the um like the production process? Did you do like separations and some of the other like um uh, activities that are part of the screen printing process? Uh no, not for this one. Uh they did it all there. Yeah, they have their own unique method of of doing that. Well, I used to do a lot of color separating when I did uh, skateboard designs. Awesome, very cool. And you, so uh, the other print that I thought was really interesting, just from a unique process perspective, was that community zoo print, and, and you mentioned it a little bit a minute ago. How did that come about? So, like, I, I know that you you had, um, you know, there was a painting in your your mid-career retrospective that I think it was Mortal Coil um, also yeah, had yeah. sign of a community element to it where you were inviting input. Uh, and then you then later did this community zoo um, where I think midway through the painting process, you just asked people, hey, give me an item and I'll insert it. And it seemed like you were you're pretty far along in the painting. Um, so like, how did you arrive at that idea? Was it something that you'd always intended to do or was it something you just kind of thought of midway through and you're like, Oh, this would be cool to add to this. No, I I wanted to do that. I was like, yeah, I kind of like laid out this big building. I was like, all right, there's all these windows and ledges. There's a lot to like just incorporate. So yeah, I just kind of built the structure of like the city and then, and then had like a bunch of things. Like there were just elements that like the whole on the rooftop, there was like the, giant mermaid with a bunch of satellite dishes all over right, it right. there was a couple of things that i just kind of had in my head already and uh yeah i i like torturing myself so <laughs> like, all right let's do hundreds and hundreds of things <laughs> um were there were there um any things that people had suggested that made you change the you know something that you had already worked on that you had to rework in order to get that in 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. There was one, there was a, what did I end up changing? But like in the beginning, there was a bill, big billboard with a peacock on it. And that just doesn't exist in the painting anymore. It turned into a bunch of other things. Yeah. Like reworking. Yeah. It's like constantly like, all right, this, this would be better here, I think. Now, was that original painting um, for a show? Was it for a commission? Like, what was the, the destination for that piece? It was going to be a print. Okay. Yeah. I was like, this is this is this concept print, the community <laughs> effort. No, I love it. Um, and the, the print was pretty big. Was the, the painting even bigger? Uh, no, the painting was a lot smaller than the first one, like the okay. mortar coil snake one. Yeah, I've, maybe it was... How big was it? Maybe, uh, yeah, I guess it was this big. It was um, 36 by 48. Not too big. Awesome. Um, one thing that I wanted to kind of uh, scratch the surface with last time but didn't really get into was uh, the private commission work that you do, which is something that you kind of take on here and there, you know, mm -hmm. a select number of private commissions throughout the year. Is the way that you work on private commissions fundamentally different or similar to how you work on? the work that's going into a gallery show or into a, you know, your studio work? Uh, it tends to be different. I try, I wish it wasn't, I got to change my approach, but when people have too much, like uh, they have a lot of input, then I will try to satisfy all that input and it starts becoming not my thing. Yeah. I know that like some commissions I've done, it's like, oh, this is not, what I would have done naturally. And I'm trying to appease the person who's asking for the commission. Yeah. Like I think it works better when somebody has a very vague idea, like, Oh, I like these paintings that you do like something in that genre, maybe this color scheme or something. And then that's when things work well. But when people have like a lot of very specific things and it's, it's hard for me to, cause I'm trying to do what they want. Right, right. But I don't really know what's in their head. So I'm just kind of trying to, it becomes a checklist instead of like an overall uh, narrative. Have you ever just turned away a project because it was just too, uh, you know, unaligned or misaligned with your own artistic sensibilities? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. Is there usually a lot of back and forth, like people with very specific ideas of what they want? Is there usually, a, I mean, or is that more rare? Is it more the the case where you want it to be, where somebody just comes to you and said, "Hey, I really like your work. I'd love something in that same vein. Go to town." Like, which one's more common? I love that. The best work comes out of that. Yeah, the ones that are back and forth a lot, uh, those turn out okay too. But it it becomes, uh, yeah. I mean, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the person what they want for sure. So, which one's more regular? Like, which one's more frequent? Do you m get more of the ones you prefer? It's a mix. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's, it's about half and half. Okay. Okay. Is there like a certain percentage of these that you like to do each year, or is it kind of seasonal that, you know, in between shows when you have time? Yeah. They, they just kind of, it just kind of comes up and, and I'm just like, okay, um, this is really exciting. I'm already working on something I'll like work on, you know, we'll, we'll like just keep in contact. It's pretty, uh, there isn't a very st structured system. I, yeah, I like doing a couple of them a year, but usually, uh, yeah, a lot of times I'll just lately, it seems like I'll, I'll work on something. I'll post something like on social media and then somebody will inquire about it. And that's been like a thing sometimes a lot more often than in past years so that makes it easy it's like oh you you like this okay yeah nobody's really talked about this yet so let's talk awesome and and in that way it's completely your idea and you don't even have to worry about uh, outside mm -hmm. pressure of people's you know their own ideas of what that should 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 or shouldn't be you know so last time we talked about uh, your 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 Petrichor show, the mid career retrospective that you had in Arizona. Uh, but one thing that came out of that that I, I wanted to talk with you about, it just didn't have time for, was the book that you put out in conjunction with that uh, called Poisonous Birds. Um, beautiful hardcover book, enclosing like 
300 pages uh, kind of cataloging the work that you'd done from 2001 to 2018, which I felt was a perfect companion to that, that retrospective event. Uh, who's, I guess, was that always the idea to have a book come out with the retrospective or who, who's, how did that idea spawn and like whose idea was that? Uh, yeah, like the, the guys at ThinkSpace, you know, they, they kind of pushed for that and I was like, okay. Yeah, like it, uh, so they had put it all together. Like I just, I guess I had been, the idea of having a book had been there. And so I was kind of organizing them for a while now, like by date. And, uh, but yeah, it was like really overwhelming to actually lay out a book. I never laid out a book before. And so I just kind of had all the files. And then when the, the show started coming together, yeah, they like, let's do this. And I was like, okay, here, here here's the (laughs) the files help me. And, uh, yeah, it's cool to have a book. Finally, I feel like all my peers have had books, multiple books. And so it's like, yeah, it's good to have one. And I'm, uh, I'm in the middle of, of working on another one and it's just going to be my drawings, which I really, um, I think that's something that people don't see as much of, but for the most part, and I was just like going through old hard drives, just like even like old scans that are pretty pixelated. I feel like a lot of this stuff, they're like the origins of a lot of the ideas for the paintings, a lot of doodles. So I just want to have a, a book of just my like notes and sketches. And I have a lot of sketchbooks too. I just throw them all in there, almost like a scrapbook. And it doesn't have to be... I kind of want it to be super busy and like a lot of information. I want people to bring it into the bathroom and like sit there <laughs> and on their phone, like look through my drawing book, please. No, that's beautiful. I mean, I love that because I mean, as somebody who nerds out about like the origin of an idea and how it develops and blossoms into what the eventual thing is, I think it's always fascinating to see how people get to the end state. So I love that the kind of just inclusion of everything let's give all of the the sketches and the notes about the sketches and the the sketchbooks i personally uh am a big nerd about that stuff so (laughs) all right good yeah i I hope more yeah i hope other people will find the the doodles uh uh yeah informative or interesting um because yeah a lot of these things never become paintings and they're just like these ideas Awesome. Very cool. For the, um, the poisonous birds book, you mentioned laying it out. Did how, like, how involved were you with the like design and layout of the book was, did you do all of that or was there somebody else kind of helping with it? Um, I, uh, Anthony who, uh, they all did it at think space. Like there was a couple of images where I, I wanted close ups and like double page spreads. So yeah, so they were kind of, I just kind of set them up with, the files and in kind of with the dates that they were painted in. Yeah. Each file just had the name and date and size. And so they just took those things. And so, yeah, so they laid out the book, but yeah, I just gave them a sort of compiled group of different folders with dates. Well, it turned out beautifully, and then and the deluxe edition obviously had that slip cover and that beautiful production on on the whole thing. So, I'm excited to see uh, what the next book uh, is. That something you're planning to do this year, or is it just kind of far off in the future when you get to it? You know, I would like to say this year, but I'm like <laughs> I'm looking at myself in the mirror right now. Like, is right. it going to happen? But all the the files are all like scanned. There's just hundreds and hundreds of them. The book doesn't need to be color corrected because it's just going to be, it's just drawings. That that's like a nice thing because color correcting with book manufacturing, I mean, that was that was really tough to uh, come up with compromises and like the back and forth with uh, choosing paper and color profiles and like I don't have to deal with that with this drawing book. It's this grayscale, it's great. And yeah, I hope it comes out soon. I'm yeah, I'm just in dealing with the show right now and then going to go with that. And I might do them in like sections uh, because I do want to write a lot of notes. So they might be like more thinner books that are instead of like one big compilation. 
Oh, so like volumes, so like multiple volumes? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. Maybe I can kind of organize them more it in themes. Cuz yeah, some of the books that I uh have like yeah, it's just nice when they're the sketchbooks or like this is volume 1 and 2 and 3. Awesome. Well, I look forward to it. Uh, speaking of your new show, let's dive more into that. Um, you know, opening May 4th, uh, the Saturday after this, this episode should debut, uh, the, the exhibition is titled Beetle Shell. Uh, so I guess, you know, with this being the first show after your mid-career retrospective, um, does that give uh, like additional meaning to this show for you? Like, you know, as far as it being essentially the second half of the first show of the second half of your career? <laughs> You know, um, I, I think that this, I'm just still going, I'm still like slowly evolving. This isn't, uh, me doing like a 180 degree turn and like changing into something else. Um, a lot of the reoccurring themes of like exploration and, you know, the surreal take on like the scale of things and it's all, um, just a continuation of that. I'm like looking at them. I printed them all out. So I'm like looking at a lot of the, the paintings and uh, yeah, I'm like, I have a different palette this time. I'm using a lot of different colors that I haven't used. Yeah. I'm excited to show them off there. Uh, yeah. Just this constant like tweaking of just revisiting this sur- surreal world, but I'm just uh, adding a, yeah, little bits of new things. The whole title, the title beetle shell, it's just more of a like this concept. It's not like, but I'm not painting a bunch of beetle shells. It's, uh, but it's just like the idea of like, uh, I like the the way that the word shell can mean like a seashell or like, you know, covering a seed um, or a bug, and uh, it like protects it, whatever it is, until it doesn't. Then it just becomes this like ornament, like a jewelry like a scarab jewelry or like a, a seashell like this on the table and uh yeah i just like uh i just like the idea of just saying the word beetle shell and so the the name of it came like later on i'm like just looking at all of these uh these paintings a lot of them have to do with uh they're they're like some of these things are artifacts like i have it was like a, a couple of the paintings are almost like triptychs or their pairs and I have just like the I wish I could just show them on the podcast <laughs> right. yeah. but um yeah some of the ones that are like more artifacts like there's this one that's just a, a painting of a a piece of amber and there's just like a tiny like fossil of a sh- of a ship inside of it mm, nice it's like a piece of it's like a fossil but it's like a tiny it looks like a tiny speck of something but it's like this uh, little boat I don't know nice that's all if there's any images you want me to share with the podcast like i can put those on the website too so you know feel free to send that over i'm happy to okay. to put that up sure yeah yeah i will yeah hopefully i'll have like 20 paintings i think in the show something like that so. awesome and i love that idea about like just what you described about a shell's purpose after its purpose you know like the 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 change in purpose that a thing has uh you know, over years. I think that's super interesting. I never really thought about that. You know, a shell in its original state is going to have one purpose, but after it serves that purpose, it may serve a different purpose. And like, that's interesting. (laughs) So like, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned that that was something that you came to after you were kind of reflecting on the work that you had already done. Is that generally how you approach shows or do you sometimes define the the theme up front and then kind of work within those boundaries. How do you like to approach your solo shows for that? Um, I'll usually think of a title as like the accumulation of the pieces start uh, coming together because the way I work, I'm trying to make each piece stand alone by itself instead of working them as a group. Like this is like, you know, 10 paintings that are all about one thing. I'm usually just working one by one. And then I'm trying to just bridge the gap in between those two to kind of make them feel like they go together. And so, yeah, when it comes to the title, it kind of comes about through that process. And I don't know if that's like a normal thing, but that's what I've been feeling comfortable with. And it's weird to do a solo show because of that aspect of like the way I'm creating things. I like kind of just doing one-offs 
after one off. Sure. That might change though. I should, I've been, when I look at other artists, yeah. And they just do these big series with like a one very specific concept or they're playing with a, an idea. Like I, I, I'm always bouncing around, but it might be nice to finally like sit there and really, really just focus on like, this is about painting about doorknobs and here's a, <laughs> here's a bunch of paintings of doorknobs in there. Right. Right. I think it's interesting though. Like I definitely understand what you're, you're saying, but, and, and this is something again that I, I think somebody told me and it opened my mind a little bit because I hadn't really thought about it in that way either, which is just the very fact that it's, you know, it's your work and it's a moment in time. It's the work that you've done over the last year, the last couple of years. That in and of itself is sort of a grouping because it's like, where's your head at in that period of time? That can be a theme in and of itself. It's like, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, the natural way that I kind of approach the world uh, in these last two years. And that's unique compared to the two years prior to that or the three years prior to that. Um, so in that sense, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have a prescribed theme to still have a theme, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yes, that makes sense. It <laughs> makes sense to like this show too. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you do any, I know you, you, we talked about this last time that you have, often made models uh, to kind of model out the physical thing that you're you're trying to to create did you do that any of for any of the pieces in this show um you know claire post for one um i did use um blender for one of the paintings to kind of mock up the lighting source a little bit but most of these are just uh, uh not really referenced much they're all very much out of my head yeah Okay. So yeah, I guess there's like different categories of the way I'm approaching painting. Some of them are pretty referenced and some of them are just almost like whimsical, you know, made up things. And, uh, and some of them I'm like using some Photoshop and like, uh, kind of compiling a makeshift maquette or just straight up making, making a little sculpture, which is really fun. Yeah. No maquettes in this one. At the time we're recording this, it's about a month out. Are you still working on the show? Are there any pieces that you're still wrapping up? Uh, yeah, there's a couple smaller pieces that I'm I'm doing now, and yeah, but the majority of the show's done. All the bigger pieces are. Some of them are a little looser, which I'm excited about. I'm always talking about trying to do looser, and yeah. so. We, we talked about that last time that like, yeah, you, it's tough, you, you, you had said like after the retrospective, you're like, oh, I have the freedom now to explore kind of some of these new ways of working. Do you feel like you were able to do some of that exploration? Um, no, I, I, I should have been, but I, I just feel like, yeah, after the retrospective, um, I feel like, oh, that was like the world changed. Like right after that, like COVID kind of shut down and then like things just took different directions. Not that that's really an ex excuse. I'm, I'm making it up as an excuse. I just need to start <laughs> loosening up. Um, but yeah, to there's always this thing of like, oh, like I'm sending this to a gallery. Like, is me being loose? Is that just like not putting the effort in? Like when I see other people doing loose stuff, I'm not thinking that, but just in myself, like I think that because some of like the more gestural stuff, like the way people use brush strokes and just are loose. I, I mean, I love the, that stuff. There's a beauty in the confidence of just having something loose. Yeah. It's just a matter of quieting that voice of like self criticism, I guess in a way. Yeah. Yeah. The effort that, yeah, it's, um, I don't know why it's something I continue struggling with, but I'm going to have a couple loose pieces. So we'll see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. How do you, uh, for shows that, that you have a, a large body of work, um, how do you do framing? Is that something that like you send the pieces to the gallery first and then like they manage that or do you, are you involved in how the pieces are framed? Oh yeah. That, that's a mix of the, the two. A lot of the, these pieces are kind of cradled wood. So if any of them are going to have frames, they will be those floater frames, which I've, I've grown to like a lot because in, earlier in my career, I really liked a big frame. And now I just like, oh, I just want like a simple frame. 
Yeah, I like I love the floater frames now, where it's just like a thin line around with a little space around it. Um, uh, yeah, so it's whatever. Like it's uh, sometimes I'll just be shopping around and I'll like pick up a frame. Well, all of my smaller pieces, I'll just pick up a frame that I'll see. I'm like, okay, I'm I like the way this frame looks. I'm gonna make a painting to fit this frame. Oh wow, <laughs> that's like a fun way to like art direct yourself that's right. open it's freely open it's like i just like the molding of this nice um do you know how many pieces there's going to be uh, all together it won't be more than 20 but about that you know maybe right now it's it's looking probably like 18 or not but, but you know i'm scrambling right now so i'm going to try to shoot for that Okay. And and this is the first time that you're showing in things spaces, you know, new location, which I from what I understand yeah. is is larger than um, you know, the the last space that they inhabited. Uh did that factor in at all into how you like approached this show? Yeah, like I'm trying to fill up the space. It's huge. Um I don't really paint that large, but this this has a group of pretty large pieces. But I think that it's okay. They can have space in between, <laughs> you know, the yeah. paintings. But yeah, like the idea, like, oh, we got to, I got to fill up this really big, beautiful space. Yeah. So I'm, I'm painting bigger than, than normal. Okay. Is there a particular piece in the show that, that challenged you, um, maybe more than some of the others? Uh, yeah. These ones behind me that, uh, yeah, there were some, some paintings where I just kind of had like a, pretty vague idea of what I wanted to sketch out and then they kind of had their a life of their own so I've been working on them for the past year just like oh wow just, just a little bit here and there usually I have like a more of a clear concept when I'm starting so some of these paintings it's kind of nice to like I'm almost just sculpting out of the surface and that's been kind of fun a little more uh not not a preconceived idea right? so I think that that's kind of interesting. Well, it's also interesting that just like having a piece that was created over that span of time where your own head was in different places at different points in time of its creation is mm -hmm. kind of fascinating in, in its own way. Did you ever find that when you came back to a piece that you've been doing for a long term, like I'm in a completely different place now. I don't really like the way I did that thing. I'm going to do it over again. Does it cause you to kind of constantly redo parts of it <laughs> yeah that Knox painting was a totally different painting and like wow. the un like the underneath all those like weird colorings and stuff that's a different painting underneath it oh wow yeah it's like a painting of like a rabbit or something that i just <laughs> like i yeah i wasn't really into and so i just like kind of used parts of it to like help uh kind of sculpt the the painting on top of it and I kind of like that because there's something nice about painting on top of oil because like when I'm usually working, I'm just, it's a gessoed surface and then, you know, I put a ground on it, but when there's a painting and then I'm painting on top of it, an older painting, I, it's, I love using, you know, I'll like put the painting upside down, the old painting, and then I'll like recreate something on top of it. Mm. Uh, I love the way the paint pushes around and then using the details from the previous painting to kind of help out the new painting. They're unpredictable stuff. I, I really like that kind of. That's interesting. It's almost like a, what's the, the word? Um, palimpsest, like mm. where you're writing mm -hmm. on top of an erased piece of writing. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. There I is like the idea. history of the painting is right. showing through. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, are, are you going to be uh, attending the opening? Yes. I'll be there. Yeah. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be wearing a Beatle outfit or a oh, yeah? Star Wars outfit. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. May the 4th. Yeah. Yeah. May the 4th. Well, I wonder how many people we should have an over under on like, how many people are going to show up in Star Wars gear. <laughs> Get a, a free print if you dress as Yoda. <laughs> Do you think there will be a, a show print or a print on the, the opening night? Yeah. Yeah. I so. The details haven't been figured out, but I do want to do one of the main pieces, a pretty large print. And yeah, I might even do it on canvas. That's something that. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, just something that's pretty unique to uh, what I've been doing. Um, but yeah, I wanted, I've been wanting to diversify the kind of reproductions I'm doing. And uh, 
and have just a different type of uh, material. But yeah, I'm like thinking about doing a very s- limited run of a large print and then I guess Sean's print, since it's the same time, will just be one that will be probably available at the opening for anybody who wants to just pick one up for, uh, yeah, help out the gallery. Awesome. Very cool. I'm excited. Um, again, I was telling you before, this is uh, one that I'm, uh, it's my first time traveling before or since COVID. So I'm excited to to make it out as well. I won't be wearing a Star Wars outfit, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No Yoda print. Um, well, that's exciting. Anything. So, you know, you, you t- we talked about the new show. You talked about the, the book that you're planning on and hoping uh, to release, you know, at least in portion this year. Um, anything else that you have coming up that you'd want to put on people's radar uh, beyond that? Oh, um, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things I have going on, but oh, you know, uh, I'll just have to just tell people because I, I feel like since I don't have exact timelines on things, I'm just like me saying like, so I have a t-shirt that I'm, I've already designed that I'm be putting nice. out like stuff like that. I'm excited about. Cause for some reason I've never done really any merch and I don't know why, even though I've done t-shirts and stuff for other people, I've never done one for just myself. Oh, I love that. And yeah, just like simple things like that. Um, and I've been in LA having some meetings with some production things. So, uh, yeah, there's some things coming up that, uh, we'll see how they kind of work themselves out, um, in the next year, but, uh, nice branching out outside of prints. I think that the people that have been collecting prints have, they don't have any more room. <laughs> they, need, they need new, new things, it's more sculptures, that kind of stuff, which, I guess, where do you think those will be available whenever they do come out? Shirts and sculptures, is that going to be on your site or? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, why don't you remind people where folks uh, can find you if they don't already know? Yeah. See esau.net or uh, Instagram slash esau. And those are the two spots that I seem to be updating. Awesome. Well, I will ask you one more time because, um, again, this will be the only person that's had a chance to answer this twice. Uh, who was, and, and I have been trying to get the people you recommended before. It just hasn't, <laughs> hasn't worked out. So you get a second shot. Who's one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Well, I don't know it, how well his English is, but there's this guy named Nicholas Askar. Okay. I don't know him, but I love his work. And he does these, he's um, Swedish. And he just does these surreal still lifes. And I've been really into a lot of these artists that are doing surreal still lifes. There's a group of them that I'm just, I really like the way he approaches his ideas. Um, Yeah, I don't know him personally. I bought his book. We've interacted online a little bit, but um, anything he puts out is just gorgeous. I'm sure he'd be cool to talk to. If not him, there's this other guy, Nicholas Uribe. Um, I went to school with him and he's kind of uh, like an art history lover. He, he's really interesting. He really likes everything about art and art history and technique. And he'll be able to have like a 10 hour podcast with you. <laughs> yeah, he's really good. Very cool. Great, great suggestions. And Esau, thank you again for, for doing this a second time. I, I always enjoy catching up with you. So I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Good talking to you, too. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Isao. It was interesting to talk with him about the relationship that he has with private commission work and about what he thinks makes for the best commission projects. I'll never really understand when folks approach an artist to do a commission and have this like super specific vision in their heads about what they want and, and you know, give the artist all of these parameters that have to be met. There's no way you're going to get someone's best work under those conditions. And isn't that what you want? A piece from an artist that you love, that you're proud to own because it's some of their best work? The private commissions that yield the best work 
are the ones where the people gave the artist complete freedom and maybe only gave a small prompt to kick things off. Like, I liked this other piece that you did. What if we explored that idea some more? Or I love your paintings with X in them. I'd, I'd love to see more pieces in that vein. You know, stuff like that. You're going to get an artist's best work if you're not handcuffing them to a fully fleshed out idea that you have in your head. So it's interesting to talk about that in the context of his experience. I'm really excited about Esau's new show, titled Beetle Shell. The opening reception is May 4th at ThinkSpace, the Saturday after this episode comes out. There will be around 20 new pieces, or just under that, and several really large works as well, to take advantage of ThinkSpace's larger gallery space. But it also sounds like there's going to be a good assortment of other sizes too. There should also be a show print on opening night, which may even be on canvas, as well as the Sean Forever fundraising edition that should be available by the time the show drops. And I'll actually be attending the show myself. Like I mentioned, this will be the first time that I've traveled for an exhibition, which is something that I used to do regularly, at least a couple times a year. Um, But this will be the first one since the start of COVID. Uh, I'm excited to start, you know, doing some of that again. So if you're also planning to go, definitely say hi. I'd love to meet some more of you. So it was curious to hear Esau kind of reflect on the number of prints that he's put out throughout his career. I sort of sensed that that was weighing on him a bit, almost, you know? The thought that people are sort of reaching max capacity uh, in terms of owning, you know, so many prints uh, and seeing people with their home completely decked out wall to wall with with his prints and what that means for the future. You know, Um, I will say that I, for one, will never pass up an opportunity to buy a print of his work. Uh, And I know there are others out there who feel the same, uh, but I can totally understand that concern. And just, you know, being thoughtful about that. It seems like he started to think about other types of things to release beyond prints, like t-shirts and figures. I would absolutely love a t-shirt of his. I'm a big, like, band t-shirt kind of guy. I have closets and closets of, uh, well, no, I have a closet full of t-shirts. But I, I would absolutely love some from him. So I can't wait for that. Definitely be sure to follow Esau's Instagram to keep up with all these things he's working on. So thanks again to Esau for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artaffairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Thank you.